Hey there friends, Dave Philitis, k Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. This is a missing person segment, and this is a special edition. And this one is a really good one. By, by that I mean a lot of twists and turns, a lot of confusion, and a lot of weirdness. First story. You're going to pay close attention to these stories because they're intermingled like this. First one, incident happened February 14th, 1953. It was a National Airlines Flight 470, a DC-6. And you say, Dave, what does a DC-6 look like? Looks just like that. Four engine plane flown by National Airlines. Well, that's who was flying it. And it was flown from Tampa to New Orleans, 491 miles distance. Left Tampa International Airport at 2.40 p.m. And it was due in at 2.45 p.m. at New Orleans Mountain Standard Time. The captain, Ernest Spring, this is Ernest, very experienced National Airlines pilot, made his last transmission at 3.45 p.m., radioed his position 250 miles east of uh, Petersburg over the Gulf of Mexico. Petersburg, Florida. There were 41 passengers, a crew of five, and it was reported that good visibility, light weather, nothing huge. Now, Ernest didn't know what was happening, and the U.S. Weather Service wasn't telling him. In those days, in 1953, Airlines didn't have their own weather men or women. Nowadays they do. So they depended on the National Weather Service. And they reported 25 mile an hour winds, semi clear weather, and Ernest flew on just like a good pilot would have. He wasn't told that there was a frontal wave storm. That was the word, a frontal wave storm storm about to hit just off the Louisiana coast where he was flying. Well this frontal wave storm had a hundred mile an hour winds and 20 foot waves off the coast of New Orleans and Louisiana. Let me read you what an article said about what this airliner flew into. This is uh, the Lubbock Morning Avalanche, February 17th, 1953. Demands for an immediate congressional investigation of the freakish crash were voiced by Representative Hale Boggs, a Democrat from Louisiana. He said that if such weather conditions existed in the Gulf, the plane would not have ventured over it. But Weatherman said it, but Weatherman said that the sudden storm was a such a freakish type that only one other had been recorded in a half century. They called it a million to one meeting of an airplane in fatal turbulence. Do you realize how strange that is? Well, the DC-6 went off radar and immediately the Coast Guard the Navy all grouped together, but they said, we're not flying out in that. So they had to wait a long time before they could go out and look for this plane. Well, on February 16th, 44 miles southeast of Mobile, Alabama, 17 bodies were found on the surface. A plane landing ahead of Flight 470 
reported to the tower of severe turbulence. But the tower didn't tell Captain Spring. 1703, last transmission stated he was going from 10,000 feet to 4,500 feet because of heavy turbulence. Then it went off radar. Well, private divers paid for by the family, two months, correct that, three months after the crash, they found the portions of the wreckage 43 feet deep, seven miles off Point Morgan. This is where the wreckage was found. Just outside of Mobile, Alabama, uh, Mobile, Alabama. This is New Orleans. New Orleans. This is where it crashed. Okay. Now, National Airlines were devastated. They were devastated. And they did all they could for that first two months to find the plane. Navy, Coast Guard, everybody went out there. They couldn't find it. It was two private divers that found the wreckage and with the funds from other family members went out and found the plane. Now, what's fascinating to me, and you're gonna see how this all comes together. This isn't it. But first of all, they said that this turbulence was so severe, it took the wing off the plane, causing the plane to crash into the ocean, or well, the Gulf of Mexico. And this was again, February 14th, 1953. Keep that in mind. These are important dates. National Airlines off of Mobile, Alabama, about 150 miles from New Orleans. And this was a flight, Tampa to New Orleans. And again, the wording is a million to one, that plane hitting that fatal turbulence. 46 people on board, 491 mile trip, they considered the DC-6 one of the biggest planes at the time. Now, how this all comes together. First incident happened February 1953. Number two incident. You've never heard of what I'm telling you. November 16th, 1959. First incident, February 14th, 1953. So about six and a half years later, same airline, National Airlines. Same route, Tampa to New Orleans. Went missing November 16th, 1959. Now remember they said in here, it was a million to one shot that this plane hit this Turbulence. Now hold on to your seats because this story even gets stranger. November 16th, 1959, 36 passengers, crew of six, 42 people. Flight 967 had no radio messages of impending issues. Nothing. Radar. Military radar observed the plane 108 miles east-southeast of New Orleans, about 30 miles east of Pittstown, and described it right on the course to go into New Orleans. Now this is strange part number one of this second story. The aircraft was owned by Delta Airlines, operated by National Airlines on, under what was called an equipment exchange agreement. Never heard of that? That's what was stated. The crew had Captain Frank Todd, co-pilot Dick Beebe, flight engineer George Clark Jr., 
and two stewardesses. The crew was described as extremely experienced. Now this flight originated, oh wait, wait a minute, wait, wait, back up. So I described to you the three crewmen. But they also stated that there was a fourth part of the crew, which is not normal, it was a man named Jack, Jack Atkinson, and he was described as an FAA member. It was never described why he was on the plane, but he was described as a fourth crew member, oddity number two. Flight originated in Miami, 10, 12 p.m. it landed in Tampa, and at 11 p.m., passengers disembarked and loaded, final count of 36 passengers. The weight on the plane was 11,000 pounds under maximum takeoff weight. It departed at uh, Tampa International Airport, 11.32 p.m. Again, National Airlines flight. No severe weather was forecasted at all anywhere. Air traffic control cleared them for a route at 14,000 feet, exactly the same altitude the prior flight I talked to you about was flying at. Now, at 44 minutes past midnight was the last radio contact that the captain made to FAA flight control in Pensacola. And it said that it was leaving 14,000 feet, going down to 7,000 feet for their approach into New Orleans. They then contacted National Airlines Corporation on a private radio message uh, through their radio channels, which is 100% normal. At 1.06 a.m., National tried again and repeatedly to contact the airplane. They couldn't reach it. New Orleans Approach Control tried repeatedly to contact the National Airlines pilots. They couldn't. Subsequent investigation showed that two military installations were tracking Flight 967 on course the entire time, described nothing unusual. And they specifically stay, stated, and I think this is odd, that there were no other objects in the vicinity. Hmm. Never read that in another accident report. But there was a radar installation at Huma, Louisiana. Picked up flight at 0046 hours or 46 minutes past midnight. And they tracked it at 1400 feet for three to four minutes. It was observed to make a 70 degree right turn and it disappeared from the radar scope at 51 minutes after midnight. Search and rescue was immediately dispatched. <clears throat> Coast Guard and boats from the area responded. There was a massive response. Seas were calm, weather was clear. Nothing made sense. <clears throat> National Airlines, three days later, flew a Corvair aircraft from Tampa to the location where their flight 967 was last seen. And the chief pilot for National spiraled the plane from 7,000 feet, trying to understand where it would end up in the ocean because they, they weren't finding it. They pulled out, they gave their coordinates. And in that area, they found a pillow, some torn upholstery, one life raft out of the case, but not inflated, eight bodies. Later on in the search, they found two additional tarps. They also found an oil slick 400 yards wide and a mile long in a north to south direction. And all of the bodies were in an area one and a half to two miles east of the oil slick. They found nine total bodies of 42 people and one additional partial body. They found five life rafts, five life vests, some shoes, 
some parts of suitcases, and all of the bodies were identified later on through fingerprints, which standard procedure. They were all described as having traumatic injuries. They made an interesting statement in that everybody that they found was seat belted in. But they found no seat belt abrasions on the bodies. Why is this important? So most of us sit with a seatbelt on, it's snug, but it's not tight. So when you have a sudden impact, your body squeezes against the seatbelt or your body brushes hard against the seatbelt. Happens in big car crashes as well. And you'll get abrasions, bruising. None of the bodies have that. They described no fire or smoke damage to the bodies, but they did find small fires that started on the surface of the ocean that did touch some of the bodies, but it wasn't caused by in-flight fires, they stated. Now, this is oddity number three. The Coast Guard maintained a lookout station for small aircraft in the area of this crash. And the observers saw an unusual light in the sky at 15 degrees in the general location of where 967 went down. Near the same time it went down. Now the observers didn't log anything for some reason, but they said they saw a red or dark red light. It appeared suddenly and then a vertical white light fell with a white light trail towards the ocean. They described clear skies. They could see stars in the sky. Sea was calm, water temps at 70 degrees, very livable conditions. National Airlines immediately stated that there was no mid-air collision with any other craft. Odd statement, considering they hadn't found the plane. They said there were no maintenance issues. And that was uncovered during the investigation. Now, just two days after the plane disappeared, there were headlines in the paper that said, craft found 12 miles outside of New Orleans in 90 feet of water and divers are recovering the bodies. Now, this was all over in a lot of papers. I read it. I thought, hmm, okay. Well, after the accident, or after the disappearance, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Coast Guard, the Navy, all responded. The USS Assurance and the USS Bittern were some of the main naval ships that were responding. They found nothing. They were looking for something on the bottom. They weren't finding it. Now, they found the items I, I just read to you. Life raft, bodies, some bodies, five life rafts, five life vest shoes, some parts of suitcases. But they were missing in excess of 30 bodies in an airplane, in a cause. Well, the US Fish and Wildlife sent out a ship as a search and rescue vessel and for two weeks, they dragged the area that they were finding bodies and found this oil slick. Well, they didn't find squat. And again, this was November 16th. So there's a lot of political pressure. Remember I told you that Hale Boggs made a comment about this down plane? The first one. Oddity number four. Hale Boggs disappeared in a plane in Alaska in 1972. It's kind of weird, huh? After he made it such a big deal about this first National Airlines disappearance and crash. I did a video about it. It's on this channel. You can watch it. It's one of the strangest disappearances ever. 
So, the Navy used sonar, grappling hooks, and they had four divers, pro divers, that they dispatched and they searched from January 27th to February 5th. Then, November 7th, 1960, the families got together and the insurance companies and they searched 30 square miles privately with the most sophisticated search methods known at the time. You know what they found? Nothing. Now the interesting part of this is the water in that area isn't very deep. It makes diving very doable. But they couldn't find anything. Now, the crash report, first let me show you. This was the flight path. Started in Miami, went to Tampa, flew across the Gulf to New Orleans. This is the type of airplane they were flying. And this, this airplane, it looks a lot like the other airplane, but this was a DC-7B. N4891C Charles. No radio message of impending trouble. Nothing. This is important. All circumstantial evidence in this case and nothing was recovered from the seafloor. No warnings of a disaster. Crew was described as very competent. They went through, went through the maintenance records on the plane, found nothing. And the FAA came up with the most unusual determination of cause of a craft that they ever have and they ever will. And they stated unknown cause of the accident. Now, the nineteen fifty three crash. Formless search, they eventually found that plane at the bottom of the ocean. Two years later, a passenger on that plane, Leon Renfro, settled a suit for, with National for forty five thousand dollars. But, but, it said the mystery uh, still surrounds the accident, flight 967. Everything I found called it a complete mystery. Now let's go back. Both planes flying from Tampa to New Orleans. Both planes, four engine, propeller, One's a DC-6, one's a DC-7. Both planes flown by National Airlines. Both planes, very experienced crew. Both planes crashed within about 150 miles of each other. So there's the 470 crash where they recovered people and wreckage. Here's where the radar contact lost anything heard of. The second crash, here's New Orleans. This entire area was searched. Very, very shallow water. National did everything they could to try to understand this. Even though the Navy, the Coast Guard, the FAA did a massive investigation and the searchers went on for months, they were having a very difficult time understanding how a big plane can just fall out of the sky with nothing from the pilots 
and nothing at the bottom of the ocean. Now, if you don't find this peculiar, something's really wrong. The bodies. I never found the autopsy results of what killed the people. It was a blunt impact, massive trauma to the body, etc. I'd also like to know where the people were sitting in the plane. I couldn't find that either. They never identified the people whose bodies were found in or around the same time frame that they were found, probably because it took a while to identify them. Now, why is this important? If mystery still surrounds the accident and the plane still has never been found, you say, well, Dave, how could that be? Let's think of MH370. Disappeared in the Indian Ocean. That's never been found. There was a Northwest Airlines flight that I talked about right here on this channel, and I did a video about that disappeared off the coast of Michigan. That's never been found. There's an Air Force jet that disappeared in Lake Superior off the northern coast of Michigan, chasing a UFO that I did a video of right here it was never found. The idea that a large airplane, a commercial plane, can disappear and nobody be found, it seems like that's impossible. Huck, this is pretty funny. Stop here for the story. Angie's sister has been visiting us for the last several days. And she has a dog. It's like a, it could be Huck's brother. And it's really the first time those two have been around dogs of equal size for any period of time. And those two are wrestling, running, pushing, not being mean to each other but just absolutely wearing each other out every minute of the day. And we've talked and we said, this is going to be so sad when they leave. Huck's going to be so lonely. Now, Huck's been fixed. The other dog's been fixed. So there's none of that hanky-panky going on. But, oh, it's just, it's been a hilarious couple of days. So I'm sure they're on the backyard running around being crazy. And that's what you hear. One of them just barking at the other and, it's not a mean growl, they're just playing. So, when I first heard about these two incidents, I thought, well, let's think about this. What would be the odds that it's the same airline? Well, Dave, that's it's pretty thin. Probably not likely. What are the odds that it would be the same route, Tampa to New Orleans? Well, Dave, that, that would be a quite unusual. And what would it be if they both went into the Gulf of Mexico? Well, Dave, that, that's, that's a little bit of a stretch. And lastly, what would it be if it was within 125 miles of each other? Well, Dave, that, <laughs> that's a little bit of a stretch. And no kidding. Come on, folks. Wake up. There's no doubt something's going on here that our government isn't and wasn't going to talk to us about. I wasn't the only big airliner to go down in that period of time. There's been many that have been strange. But when I came under this, I've never written about it, never saw it anywhere. I've never heard it talked about on another channel, but you will now. I feel very sorry for the families. I feel extraordinarily sorry for the crew. Because these, in the first incident, when we talked about the DC-6, Flight 470, Captain Springer was a great pilot. 
Nobody told him he was flying into 100 mile an hour winds, 20 foot waves that could tear his plane apart. That's crap. Poor guy never had a chance for him or his crew. God rest his soul. And then, the other incident. Flight 967. Something happened so quickly, so abruptly, that neither the pilot nor the co-pilot ever said anything. And they were never found. Friends, if you could do me a favor, if you could spread this all over social media and explain how strange this is, it would really do me a big favor. And if you like what you're seeing on this channel, please watch it a couple of times. Put it on, put it on in the background. We need your support and we need new subscribers and we need the channel to grow. I know YouTube won't help me, but maybe you will. Remember also to be nice to your neighbors, be nice to the people in your community. Do something to help someone when you see them today. It'll help your soul, it'll help your heart. And it's good for our world. Every time I'm out, I, I look for somebody who I can help. I hope you do too. I hope you have a great week. Politis out.